Good morning. This is Bill Klingberg with SCORE here in Houston. Welcome to our broadcast if we get it running. We had everything working and then we had some technical glitches. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, SCORE for those of you who don't know. We are a nationwide uh, volunteer organization with 11,000 members. Uh, here in Houston, we have 150 members, including uh, lawyers, accountants, sales and marketing people, manufacturing, etc., from all different uh, industries. We are the largest chapter in the United States. We offer mentoring, which is free and confidential, as well as webinars, and someday we will love. We would like to go back to face-to-face -face workshops. We also have a number of educational tools on our website which is houston.score.org. We have templates for business plans. We've got Excel spreadsheets for figuring out cash flow and a lot of other things on the website. <clears throat> Pardon me. And here comes our presentation. Our presenter today is Nick Tarte. He is a SCORE mentor for a number of years now. And um, I'm... Nick, you ready? Yes, sir. Can okay. you hear me? I'm, I'm going to let Nick take it away. Thank you very much. Can right. you hear me, Bill? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay, awesome. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Nick, Nick Tarte. Uh, <clears throat> and as the title says, we're going to, going to be discussing the single family uh, building income through single families, uh, through real estate. Actually, there's single family and then there's other stuff. And we're going to touch on uh, all those different aspects. Um, this is a two-part webinar, and today's is the first part, and the second one will be two Saturdays from now, which will be on the, uh, a subsequent slide. I'll display that, and you'll get another email to register for that particular class as well. Um, just to give you an idea, real estate is a really, really vast subject. I mean, it's really an ocean. And so when people say they're doing something in real estate, that can mean anything and everything. Um, if you own a little bit of a little bit of a lot, like a 4,000 square feet lot, where you are, you are in real estate. If you own multiple office buildings, you are in real estate. Uh, if you own multiple apartment complexes, you are in real estate, or you could be lending to any of those people and you're also in real estate, so to speak. Uh, you could be a contractor. So we're going to go through some of these and then focus on um, the income generating part, which is the single family, which is what most people are familiar with. So I'm keeping this limited to that. Uh, I'm, I'm also gonna to touch base on what other things that people can do uh, that may not, uh, that where the capital may not be that easily available as well. So today's class is more like the ABCs. I just want to set your expectations because unless you understand the ABCs, uh, the basics of uh, rental real estate, because there's different terms that get thrown about uh, when you start getting into that uh, quote unquote business, uh, the people that specialize in that particular area. Um, and it's important to understand what the heck they're saying and how to analyze something that someone might be saying, oh, this is so-and-so, so-and-so returns. What exactly does that mean? And why is that important? And how do you, um, how do you um, compare one versus the other? Now, you won't be able to do that unless you know the ABCs, which is what we are going to focus on today. In the part two, we're going to go through more in depth. That's where we are, you know, where the rubber hits the road, so to speak. We're going to go through how we acquire properties, what's a good, what are some good ways of acquiring uh, properties and so on and so forth. I'm trying to adjust my monitor, excuse me. Um, how do you uh, acquire them where it becomes quite profitable? 
because there's a lot of folks who do it in an unprofitable manner, including yours truly. That's what I did. Uh, and you learn from those mistakes and I'm sharing those mistakes. That's why I'm teaching. Um, it's not until you have made mistakes that you get a kick in your pants and then you realize dead gummit. Um, so here we are. So here's my email ID <clears throat> at the bottom. Uh, as Bill said, we are an affiliate of Small Business Administration. Uh, whatever questions you have, please type those in, in the Q&A box. And I will not be able to answer them in the beginning, I mean, or during the seminar, but I will at the end. This is a whole reset of what I'm used to doing. I'm used to having people in front of me, and so I'm used to seeing everyone's reaction, whether I'm making sense, not making sense. Uh, and we have a good time, actually, you know, uh, a little bit of joking and so on and so forth. Here I'm talking in front of a screen and I have no idea if, people, if you guys are understanding me. I hope you are. Uh, at the same time, you guys are just looking at a screen. And that's it. And hearing a voice, a monotonous voice. So here's what we'll do. Uh, it's a little past 10. In roughly an hour, we'll take a three minute screen break just to, so, so we don't start glaze over too much. Um, and we will resume. So three minutes exactly when we take a break and we'll resume uh, back again. This is an approximately one hour. Okay, so with that said, let's get going. Uh, this is the agenda. Um, I'm not going to go through it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I'm going to try and not read everything that's there on the slides. These slides will be shared with you. So don't take notes that are already on the slide. But if there's something that I have said apart from the slide and that you find interesting or important, then by all means, make, make a note of it. Um, so this is what we're going to go through. With that being said, let's move on. Disclaimer, I'll make some, uh, my own opinion about taxes and uh, maybe legal. Please understand, I'm not a CPA and I'm not your lawyer. Uh, and these opinions that I mentioned in, these, in this webinar are my opinions and not necessarily that of the SBA or SCORE organization. So about the present, about me. Um, so I have an IT background, Houston based, and I know there's a bunch of you from outside of Houston joined in, welcome. Uh, some of the things I might be saying may or may not apply in your state. Um, but you, so you have to be a little careful on that. Uh, you can always uh, email me or get in touch with me and we can discuss that. Uh, somewhere down the right when you uh, down the road when you get to it. Um, so I started my own company. I was working for a big company here, Compaq actually, and then I left in '96 and started my own company and then grew it uh, to a decent size with the help of a bunch of very competent people, I might add, um, and then sold it. And since then, I have been uh, just doing a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Uh, so at SCORE, where I have been mentoring for quite some time now, uh, I have been helping people with business planning, marketing, branding. Uh, I just did a webinar, yeah, this week. Seems like a long time back uh, on marketing. A lot of people wrote about how they found it pretty helpful. Um, so they, I've done a series on crowdfunding. I don't do it anymore. And of course I speak. So I give a lot of uh, seminars on behalf of SCORE. And I've been in real estate since 2007, I have a company overseas, single family since 2013. I'm a veteran, veteran of mistakes, folks. Not my butt, butt kick. I still own my first property that I bought, which is a money pit uh, that has made my life miserable at times. And I'll share with you uh, those things in the 
part two. Um, so you learn, right? I mean, you do it. Yeah, I wanted to jump in, and I and my goal was to build a portfolio of sixty to eighty rental houses. That was my goal, uh, by the way. So at one point, at the peak, I had about twenty either owning uh, and renting, or it was in the process of being flipping, uh, being flipped, uh, and of course being rehab. What we call rehab. What you folks are used to being, uh, what, what, I'm sorry, what you folks are used to saying remodel in the industry, in this industry, it's called rehabbing. Just a little bit of a uh, reset on vocabulary. Um, and then I shifted my attention over into multifamily. Uh, there's some personal reasons why I did it. I won't go into details at this webinar. So I'm in more than 24 deals. Um, and I find that it actually pays less um, than my single families did. Uh, but like I said, for personal reasons, I shifted gears. Uh, so now we're going to go through the basic introduction to real estate. And we're gonna talk about a lot of things um in the next two sections uh the basic introduction and then the various types of real estate before we dive into leverage which is taking on debt and <clears throat> so why rental real estate a lot of reasons actually uh you know and there won't be enough time for me to tell you why it's good Suffice to say, because we have a time constraint today, it gives you steady passive income. Passive mailbox income beats uh, active income where you're having to go and work for a boss every single time, trust me. Um, and it beats even having your own company doing consulting work and so on and so forth and constantly having to find clients and and deal with the vagaries of labor and clients and you know i mean i'm not blaming anyone it's just that's just the nature of the beast uh so passive income is awesome so you one of the things in real estate okay right down here uh Rental property pays down the loan balance. Interest on loans can be tax deductible. Possibility of more favorable taxation. I know I'm just kind of mumbling on, but these together, these together, is this, this icon right here is what makes real estate so powerful, okay? Um, there are three main industries in the United States. God bless the USFA, but between Congress and president, and I'm not talking about this Congress and this president only, it's been going on for decades. Uh, they have nicely loaded a whole bunch of tax breaks into three big industries. And then not, not in any particular order. One is real estate. The second one is oil and gas. And the third one is the financial sector. Um, they are, I mean, you can talk to any CPA who does tax returns for all these companies and they, they'll pay you that themselves, okay? Uh, you as a person who's got a job or even self-employed for that matter, you have very little tax breaks. Uh, if you're self-employed, you might be able to write off your, well, what the heck, part of the car you, that you use, mileage, uh, maybe some expenses um, uh, you might be able to uh, expand, uh, expense rather, uh, some office supplies you bought, and, and that's about it. Folks, that's not where the gravy is. The gravy has been loaded onto these three industries right here that I've mentioned. Oil and gas, financial, and real estate. You, the W-2 income folks, Every time you pay those federal taxes withheld that it says on your paycheck stub, you're doing us a big favor. You're giving us those tax breaks. You're funding us those tax breaks rather. Uh, every time 
you withhold taxes on a W-2 income, you are funding maybe the fifth vacation house of that oil and gas multimillionaire who wants to buy that fifth vacation house in the Bahamas. Or you're funding, not or, and funding maybe that second private jet that the hedge fund billionaire wants to buy. Because the tax breaks are incredible, folks. And we'll go through that a little bit, okay? So I can't tell you enough about how, you know, what kind of a difference I saw as I shifted my income into real estate and the impact on taxation it had. There's a good reason why our president does not disclose his tax returns, in my opinion, and the opinion of most people in the real estate sector. It's very simple. The guy is not paying any taxes. He doesn't want to disclose that. And it's not like he may be doing anything illegal. It's just that's the way that real estate sector has been loaded with a whole bunch of tax breaks. So I hope I've got through to you as to the necessity. I mean, if you want to continue funding those tax breaks and those private jets and uh, fourth and fifth vacation houses, by all means, go for it. But if you want to do something, then this is your, I'm kind of uh, hitting you in the forehead, if you would. And those of you who know me know that, you know, I do it in jest. I'm trying to wake you folks up. I mean, you either are going to, you either have to decide you are the giver or the taker. Where do you want to be? If you want to keep giving, be my guest. Uh, that helps people like me. The other part, so I'm going to get off of that rant. Sorry about that, but I hope I've woken you up with what I just said. Please pay attention. Please try and do something about this as we conclude these webinars. Um, there is a sustained increase in asset value over the years. Now, You'll say, well, Nick, I mean, you know, stocks and bonds and, you know, the stocks go Zoom and Amazon went boom and all that stuff. I get it. I'm not comparing this with Amazon, okay? Uh, if you were able to buy Amazon when Amazon first went IPO, you're the smartest investor out there, stay at it. If you have a portfolio of stocks that have just done awesome over the next 30 to 40 years, keep doing what you're doing. But if you are one of those who's, who, got, who has just one hit or one hit that misfired, or was a hit and then became a no hit, then real estate, if you look over a period of time, has just steadily, steadily, steadily increased in value, okay? Including all the recessions, including all the, even the great recession that we had in 2008, 2009 timeframe, and even till today, your house, whatever your house is worth, let's say it's worth 200 or half million, has not moved a whole lot in terms of value. Think about it for a minute. What happened to your stock portfolio? Has that happened to your house value? Did it go down by 40%, 30%, whatever it is? So something to think about, okay? Real estate holds value, rental real estate. This is what I'm talking about, rental not necessarily dirt and some other stuff, rental, especially residential and multifamily. They hold value because simple reason, simple reason, people need a place to stay. Number one. Number two, the population of America keeps increasing. And as long as you don't have a decrease in the population, this trend is going to not only continue, it's going to intensify. And I'll, I'll talk about that in some slides later. Uh, so why not real estate? Okay, it has lower liquidity. If you have stocks, you can sell them pretty quick. If you have house or a bunch of houses or even multifamily, it's, it's not something you can get out of it 
today or tomorrow. Uh, when the market goes down, it can be challenging to service the loans and there's ways to mitigate that. Not eliminate the risk, but mitigate, okay? Uh, it does need hands-on time. Unlike stocks, you just buy some stocks and then you go out and with your friends for some drinks. Well, I mean, you can do that here too, but uh, you know, it needs tending too. You, you, you're gonna have to spend some time every week. It, it does require some capital uh, and it varies. You can start off with less capital or you can have, if you have a lot of capital, well and good. But it does require capital, but then so do stocks. If you're gonna buy stocks, so do stocks. Finally, this is where, where a lot of people make, uh, I, I wouldn't call it mistakes, but it's just uh, a little bit of ignorance, which by the way, yours truly, had that as well. Uh, if you buy just one or two houses, you know, you've not educated yourself correctly, like attending webinars like this or networking, then you're likely to buy one house or two houses. And, and I know you'll do it in an inefficient manner. And then you'll go, man, yeah, it's okay, but not that great. That will be your reaction. Or worse, you might buy a single, uh, you know, one single family house, rent it out, and then find that you have a whole lot of headaches. And you go, you know what? Single family re rental uh, real estate really sucks. Well, that's because you're doing it the wrong way, my friends. You're not doing it the right way. Next one. Various types of real estate. So you have all these types of real estate over here. Uh, you've got dirt. So when people say they're in real estate, it could be in any of these things. And there's more, by the way. Uh, so I've just outlined some of the big ones, dirt. You know, you have seen office buildings. You have seen residential houses and so on and so forth. There's trailer home parks. That's also part of real estate. Uh, trailer home parks are different from RV. RVs are where people are uh, taking their RV down the roads and going and visiting different parts of America. Uh, trailer home parks are different. This is where people who are stressed on cash, they will rent a, uh, uh, what's called a manufactured home, or it could be they drag their own RV in there and park it. And what they're paying is a monthly fee to park it and get in return utilities uh, like electricity, sewage, and so on and so forth. It produces nice income, by the way, but it has some downsides. Then you have got all these things, storage centers, uh, net leases you can trade in, buy, you can buy and trade on notes. There's people, there's a person I know right here in Houston who, who literally, literally makes a, a half million to a million just, just on notes every single year. That's what he does. I keep losing my cursor, I apologize. Um, notes are when you take a loan, you have generated a promissory note. A note the promissory note says, I promise you the bank that I'm gonna pay you this much over so many months for so much period. Now you know the most prominent notes that are out there, which is the treasuries, the US treasuries. Uh, those are notes. The 10 year bond, the two year bond, 30 year bond and so on and so forth and corporate bonds too. Those are all notes, promissory notes and those get traded. Just like that in the single family, notes get traded as well. Um, and then you have REITs. REITs are like they're taking the guesswork out of everything. You just buy their stock and you have bought yourself into real estate. But I think it's an inefficient way of doing it. Less returns in my opinion. But anyway, these are all the uh, possible types of real estate investment. Now, over here, I'm focusing on two. Multifamily, 
which is your apartment complexes, and the other one is single family. As per the definition of uh, Fannie Mae and Fre uh, Freddie Mac, we, who do the vast majority of lending through banks, single family is defined as anything that is like what we stay in houses, for example, or a duplex or up to a fourplex. Up to four is single family. Anything past four, if you go into five, okay, if you go into a fiveplex, if you would, or a sixplex, that becomes multifamily. Uh, there could also be condos. Um, whoops. Or you can also have another variation of this real estate called Airbnb. A lot of people did that. They bought some real estate or they might have had a duplex where they took one part of the duplex and put it on Airbnb. And we'll talk about that in a bit. So here in this particular webinar, we are going to be talking about this right here. And mainly everything connected with this right here. In my opinion, and you'll see a lot of people tell you the same thing, condos are probably one of the worst investments you can make, okay? So especially if you are in the Texas market, uh, as far as investments go, condos make poor investment, just FYI. Now why, you, you know, we can take it offline. So, I talked about the ABCs, right? Which is what this class, uh, this webinar is focused on. Before we talk about some other things, we need to make sure that we are conversant with a few terms that are widely used in this sector. And I apologize, this screen looks quite busy, but there's just a lot of stuff. Uh, again, you don't have to take notes. I just want you to listen. And if it's not on the slide, then make a note. But one of the things that we are going to be focusing and talking a lot are these things that, I, that have been highlighted, start. The first one is ARV, stands for after repair value, Basically, it is the value of a house that once it has been, whatever, new carpet, new countertops, if it is dated, if it's dated house, that is. If it's not dated, then that's fine, that's different. But if it, it is dated, the lighting fixtures need changing, the bathroom needs updating and so on and so forth. Why? Because other properties close by sold for this much price, and currently the, this particular house is selling at this price over here, a lower price. So the ARV on this house over here is this right here. Once you do all these things like changing the flooring, painting and updating the countertops and bathrooms and stuff, you will bring up the value of that house to what the comps, Comps are comparables. And that's one of the things in single family key. No matter what you do in that house, whether you put marble countertops, for example, you are not going to get more value, okay? You are going to be restricted by what other properties nearby sold for. Leverage is the ability to get a loan. I'm not going to go through this. Cash on cash is key. This is what it's all about. That's what real estate is all about, folks. Cash on cash. How much cash did you put in and how much cash did you get back? That's what it's all about. Cash on cash is what gets measured. Cash on cash is king because cash is king. Uh, I'm not going to read through all these. Um, so most of these loans are coming from Fannie and Freddie. There's something called hard money, okay? 
And we're going to go through that in more detail in the second webinar part two. It is key. It is the key to put your returns on steroid. Sufficient to say that hard money is money that has been lent by lenders. They have been licensed. Uh, sometimes they may be private people, people like me. I might lend, lend it to you. But the interest rates tend to be a lot higher than would a normal long-term lender. So we are used to these uh, normal lendings like 30-year loans and so on and so forth when we buy a house. But these hard monies are very different. Uh, the interest rates will be three to four times, but it still makes it financially quite worthwhile. Comps, like I mentioned, are what is nearby that, that was sold nearby to your property. That is, MLS is the multiple listing service, which is where the comps come from. MLS is the uh, database that is used by realtors across the United States. And so whatever got bought, whatever got sold, whatever is for sale is all listed in this MLS. In Houston, that MLS is called HAR, Houston Association of Realtors. If you are from Austin, if you are from Dallas, if you are from other parts of the US, you have to find out what this MLS thing is called. You can just Google and it'll tell you what, what it is. Um, that's pretty much it. And then there's something called the title company that you have all heard of, which is supposed to be the third party neutral that ensures that the buyer and seller uh, are adhering to the terms that they've put in the contract and make sure, and the biggest thing that they're doing is making sure that the title passes from the seller to the buyer. And it has, and it has passed in a manner that will not mess up the buyer later on with someone says, hey, uh, you know, you owe me money. Now we're going into the lessons of leverage. Okay, it starts to get interesting here, folks. This is the linchpin of real estate. Before we, uh, you know, look at some examples. Again, it helps to understand few things. Again, the ABCs. I'm sorry, it's a little boring. Just stay with it, okay? Just stay with it. Uh, because these things become very important down the road. The term of the loan, if you get a loan, if you have bought a house, if any of you have bought a house, typically what you have done is a 30-year mortgage. That's what we call it. 30 year mortgage or a 15 year. That is a term of the loan that you have to pay it off in 15 years or 30 years. The amortization in that particular loan happens to be also what's called fully amortized. That means if you pay it, if the term of your loan is 30, it's amortized over 30 years too. Well, when you get into business of real estate, these two can change dramatically. So you could end up with a five-year loan, okay, a five-year loan, a term loan that has to be fully paid off in five years, but the monthly payments are as if they have been amortized. That means they have been divided up over the period of the amortization period, which might be 30 years, 25 years, 20 years, 15 years. It goes all over the place. And that will come about later on as you start doing more and more real estate. So this amortization is key. And there's one example I want to give you to kind of make you understand how powerful this thing is. Interest rate, uh, why I repeated this over here, didn't I? Interest rate and interest, this is repeated. Points is the, uh, you know, when you're, borrowing from a lender, the lender might say, hey, you want to go with a lower interest rate, we'll charge you one point or two points or three points. And accordingly, a loan interest will go lower. Uh, and you, you're effectively buying down that loan. Um, that's what it is. Uh, so the points are always off of 
it's a percentage as expressed percentage off of the loan amount. So one point is 1% of the loan amount, okay? And then there's closing costs involved, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, so broadly, there are two types of loans in single family investing. One is the hard money. And the other one is the long term. Most of you folks are probably not used to this thing called hard money. Okay, it's hard money because boy, the, the terms are hard. That's why it's called hard. But trust me, it can be a big, big, uh, uh, it, 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 it's like carrying a bazooka instead of a regular gun into real estate. And in that second class, that second class will will we'll, uh, discuss doing a deal without hard money and doing it with hard money. And you'll see the significant difference in what it does to your ability to make, a, uh, in your ability to buy real estate and get maximum COC, cash on cash. That is important folks, cash on cash ultimately. So here's a question for you. Low interest on a loan is better, right? So someone is offering you 5% interest or a loan with 7% interest. Which one do you think is better? Well, common sense tells you 5% is better, right? Well, it depends. And for most of us, when we are buying our regular single family, which is your, your own house, this doesn't come about, okay? Uh, because the banks are, are restricted by some very stringent lending guidelines. But when it comes to commercial, it's all over the map. And our whole focus here is to try and see how we can go from one property to two properties to multiple properties. And when you're doing those multiple properties, this stuff starts to play a big role. So here's an example. There's a lot of numbers on here. Try and not get distracted by the numbers and focus on some of the important things that I'm saying. So a 5% loan versus a 7% loan. Assuming, assume that your house that you're buying is worth 150,000, okay? I'm gonna go through this example again and again. 150 is the ARV. That means you are buying a house that is completely fixed up, nothing else to be done. It will appraise for 150,000, okay? That's your after repair value. Now, what ends up happening in a house like that, there's two ways you can do it. One is with a loan and one is without a loan. If you're doing it with a loan, typically when you're buying a house like this, you will have to put up 25% of the value of the house. If you are a hedge fund, you get to put up only 10%, just FYI. Uh, because they have enormous advantages in borrowing. They have an unlimited supply actually. Uh, but for mere mortals like us, we have to put up 25%, which for a $150,000 house is 37.5,000. I'm going to spend a little bit more time on these numbers because we're going to keep repeating these numbers in the later slides as we go through some examples. Um, so the loan amount, you know, in order to buy a $150,000 house, you out of your own pocket have put up 37,500. Therefore the loan amount is 112,500. Is that making sense? So, Again, I keep losing my pointer, but this plus this is equal to this. It's as simple as that. We're keeping it simple. There tends to be other costs, but we have kind of ignored it. Um, so now the interest rate in this column is 5%. In this example, it is 7%. 
the amortization period, what the bank is going to tell you, the lender is telling you is this 15 years and here it is 30 years. So you got a 7% loan amortized over 30 years and here you have a 5% loan amortized over 15 years. Here's what ends up happening. The annual principal and interest on this, and, I, and by the way, you can download these calculators, uh, there's apps, and calculate it yourself. Comes out to be 10,675. In the 7%, it comes out to be lower, 8,981. You're paying 10 grand over here, 10 and a half. Over here, you're paying almost 9,000. Big difference. Right here should tell you that this guy is better than this guy. Because the name of the game in real estate, whenever you're using leverage, which is loans, is you need to minimize the cash that you're paying in expenses every month, okay? Your whole objective is to minimize the cash. If you have not done that, that's where you're making a mistake. So assume $1,500 a month in rent. How does the cash on cash return looks like, COC, okay? So we are assuming $1,500 per month in rent, that equals 18,000 in both cases, less principal and interest, it's called PI, less PI is this number right here, over here. And this number over here is over here. Are you with me? You have to then subtract the taxes that you gotta pay. So 2.8% off of 150K, it's gonna be actually lower than that, but let's say it's 2.8%, will be 4,200 in both cases. Less insurance, you gotta pay insurance for both. By the way, you don't go for insurance at your regular insurance agent. When it comes to commercial real estate, there are insurance companies focused on the commercial side. So rental properties and so on and so forth, you'll get much better uh, terms than you would get from a state farm or an all state, you're in good hands and stuff like that. No, you're not in good hands. Uh, so the net cash received after subtracting from your revenue, this is your revenue, this line, minus these expenses right here, is going to give you your net cash received right here. This is your cash that you receive. So in the loan of 5%, you receive 1825 in cash. In the loan that had 7% interest, a higher interest rate, you actually received 3519. What was the cash that went out of your pocket? Remember this right here? This is your 25% that you paid. The rest was a loan. In real estate, in, in rental real estate, you always, always, always focus on what cash went out of your pocket. That's what's important. The rest is leverage. And so the cash that went out of your pocket was 37,500, whoops. And so when we calculate the cash on cash return, all you're doing is taking this number divided by this number. And this number divided by this number. Take a look what happens over here. That's when you can toast yourself with some wine and a bologna sandwich maybe. I've got these icons here for you to focus on this right here. This is what you're focusing on, right? Your cash on cash is dramatically different. It's almost double. You repeat that across house after house after house, it makes a big difference, folks, huge. In other words, in our example, a 7% loan is actually more preferable 
than a 5% why? Because of this bad boy right here, amortization. That makes a big difference. Moving on. So the, now I'm going to jump into a little bit uh, different uh, kind of uh, a different angle before we come back to the examples because I start to glaze. Um, these are the different types of uh, real estate that we talked about and these are the pros and cons. And I'm not going to repeat all of them. You're going to get it in, in, some, uh, in your slides. And there's actually more I could have put down for each, but these are the kind of highlights and tells you what the liquidity for each is. Um, so in all of these, office, commercial, retail, and warehouse, in my opinion, this is my opinion, okay? You need a significant amount of experience or a good mentor who is willing, and nobody does it for free, I promise you that. Everybody wants a percentage of whatever you're making. Um, or you have to go and work for some company and then learn, and then go out and do your own stuff. That's what gen generally people do. Uh, to run, you have, you've seen bad retail centers and you have seen some good ones. The bad ones are done by people who are uneducated, not in terms of degrees, but in terms of understanding real estate. They just, you know, they got this money sitting in the bank and they say, you know what? I want to buy this stuff which has, uh, you know, all this retail center and then next thing you know, they have screwed it up. Or they build one from scratch. They don't do it right. And it messes up. And then they say real estate is a bad, uh, bad investment. Yeah, it can be if you do it wrong. Uh, as I said before, trailer homes is very good cash on cash yielding investment. The problem is this right here, local governments are restrictions, restricting such parts. They, you know, you've got class A, multifamily, class B, class C, and class C is more the, what's called the workforce housing. You know, people who are making 10 bucks an hour, eight bucks an hour or 15 bucks an hour, they're staying in class C because they can't afford the more nicer apartments uh, in class B or class A. But if you can't even afford class C, and there's a whole bunch of Americans who can't folks, they're going into trailer home parks. You got to ask yourself, do you think that the income and inequality in America is increasing or decreasing? And if you feel that these people who are making 10 bucks an hour and nine bucks an hour, do you think that anytime soon they're going to be making 20 or 30 bucks an hour, are they? Well, if they're not, then they've got no choice but to go into these trailer home parks. Especially if you're at eight bucks and nine bucks an hour. Especially if you happen to be, a, for example, a sex offender. We've got all kinds of wonderful rules that say, you know, we don't want a sex offender next to our house or next to our neighborhood and they need to be identified. N nothing next to kids and all that, blah, blah, blah. Well, these people have no place to stay they end up in trailer home parks. Felons who might not be accepted by uh, class, even some of the class C properties because of the threat of a lawsuit from the neighbor. If that guy turns out to be a whatever, a serial killer and you've taken him on board, the last thing you want is another lawsuit. So they go into trailer home park. Trailer home parks, you end up doing nothing. There's no really service other than giving them electricity and sewage and stuff like that. It yields very well. The problem is there's no tax benefits. The whole reason why we're talking about this today is the tax benefits of real estate. Uh, I'm amazed by the amount of people who want to buy trailer home parks. And these are people from even overseas who are pouring money into America. Because for them, if it, it's yielding six, seven, eight percent, all right, let's, let's go for it. And they do. These things are 
almost full. And they're going to have even more and more occupancy over the years. It's just the way we are, uh, we are moving in this country. Single family and multifamily. So in single family, um, typically your cash and cash returns will be anywhere from eight to, I say 20 plus, it could be actually be infinite. And I'll show you an example in the second class how it can be infinite. Uh, remember cash on cash is the cash you're getting divided by the cash you put into the house. So the less cash you put into the house, your returns are going to be a lot. And there are ways to do that. So that's why I've given a range. Um, there are tax advantages. You can buy a distressed property, i.e. a property that needs is dated. And in my case, I've bought property that, that possibly look dangerous to even walk into. I wish I'd kept those pictures, but <laughs> uh, th those were like special properties and people are not even willing to go inside the house, much less buy something like that. And I did that stuff uh, and it made me a lot of money. Uh, the cons over here is that you need some experience at first, but after that, then it becomes quite doable. You will always be restrained by the comps. Remember I told you, no matter what you do in this house, if you have bought a house in houses, houses that sell, all houses are selling for $150,000 in that neighborhood that have been completely fixed up. I don't care what you do in this, your house, it's not going to sell for more than 150,000. You got to keep that in mind. So there's no point in going above what the neighborhood needs. In multifamily, that's not the case. You can increase your returns and the value of that multifamily property by increasing the income that comes from that multifamily property. The valuation of an apartment complex is based on the net income. Net operating income is what they call it. Uh, and if you are able to increase rents and reduce expenses, then you increase your net operating income. You increase your net operating income, boy, the value of this multifamily just shoots to the roof. Especially when you're measuring the cash on cash right here. You can go, you can literally, literally that's what people did in through from 2012 through 2015 and 16 they triple they triple and quadruple their money if they had put like half million they made like two million i kid you not single family i personally know i personally know a family in houston it's now a family enterprise but it didn't start out that way has 1,400 houses. Yeah, 1,400. That was not a hearing loss on your part. Uh, I mean, they're operating that as a business and they are like a machine. I personally know, on first name terms, a guy in Houston who owns a portfolio of about 180 houses. And he keeps on shuffling those properties because he's getting rid of the old ones and keeping more of the newer ones. So 2010 and later and so on and so forth. And he gets rid of the old one from time to time. But he maintains his inventory at between 160 to 180. And I also know some other folks who have a portfolio of 80 properties and so on and so forth. So this is doable. I've seen people do it. I've seen people operate it. And I've seen what it has taken for them to build up to that level. It's a business. They can go on vacation to Bahamas and that money keeps on coming into their mailbox. The rents keep coming. If you are on a W-2 income, you fall sick or your company lays you off, your income stops with passive income from these sources the money just keeps on coming that's a big difference folks i hope 
I'm making my point. I'm going to do it again and again until you guys take action. Um, both of these have tremendous tax advantages. So this is a graph. Uh, I don't know if it's accurate to be honest with you, but it's from the perspective of this uh, one particular uh, North American REIT. It's a collection of REITs by Yahoo Finance comparing REITs against um, stocks. I don't know if it's accurate, uh, to be honest with you. Like I said, it was there on the internet. Uh, the one thing I saw remarkably here was this 2008, this is when the Great Recession took place. Things really tanked. Now remember, these are REITs. These are real estate investment trusts. So they invest from office buildings to uh, retail centers and, and so on and so forth. And when the, the lending dried up, the value of their holdings tumble. But did you ever see the value of a single house tumble in Texas? Even during 2008 and 2009 period, I'm asking you. Even today, when things are frozen all across the US, has the value of your house gone down by 30%? Think about it for a minute. So in my opinion, for single family, even this doesn't hold true. It'll be more like, kind of like this, it'll go a little bit dip and then keep on going up, but it is steady, okay? So two things and keep in mind. Two things to keep in mind. One is minimize your cash out of your pocket. So you use leverage. It's called OPM, other people's money. You'll hear that term once you decide to get into this business, okay? Minimizing your cash is key. If you minimize your cash, you increase your cash on cash return because you put less into the deal and for the same amount of rent or whatever you're getting, if you're denominator is less, your returns are higher. Really as simple as that. But the key is minimizing the cash out of your pocket. And there's ways you can do that. But one of the ways is using other people's money. But there are other ways too, which we'll cover in the part two. Equity, let's talk about equity because some of you know it and some of you may not. So if those of you who know, I apologize, I might bore you. But equity is the portion that you have in that property that belongs to you. What does that mean? If you buy a $100,000 house, and let's say you put $25,000 in that house, and $75,000 is the loan, okay? Let's take that example. $100,000 house and $75,000 loan, your equity is $25,000. You with me? Pretty simple. If that house increases in value from 100 to 120, you have now gained an additional $20,000 in equity, plus the original 25,000 you had, you now have $45,000 in equity. Why? Because when you go to sell that house at 120,000, all you have to do is still pay the bank only 75,000. The rest is yours. Bank has no claim over the rest other than its loan amount. This is very important because in real estate, you get to increase your equity by quite a bit. Loans allows you to use federal government subsidies. That's you folks who are got who have W-2 income, who nicely pay taxes to the federal government in terms of federal tax withheld. Thank you so very much. I salute you. You are doing a great job for the oil and gas millionaires and the hedge fund billionaires. Keep it up. They need your tax breaks so that they can buy that fifth vacation house and their second, um, second uh, private plane 
and people like small people like me who can buy houses at a subsidized interest rate. I know I'm rubbing it into you folks. I'm rubbing it in because not to uh, mess with you, but to mess with you to take action. So if you have $150,000 house, I mean, sorry, $150,000 in cash, let's assume, what it's doing is you can either buy one $150,000 house with cash, and we're going to see that through examples on the subsequent screens, okay? You can either buy one or you can buy four. So 25% in each deal of $150,000 is $37,500. So 37,500 times four is equal to 150,000, okay? Are you with me? So if you have $150,000 cash and you have to pay 25% to the bank, and the ba to satisfy the bank that is, and the rest is a loan, then you need to put only 37,500 into each deal, which allows you to buy four houses or the alternative is you buy one house with $150,000 in cash. I have uh, hit one hour. I know you might be, uh, it's possible that you might be, uh, you know, uh, straining to concentrate. So let's take a three minute break, yeah? It's 11.05, we will resume at 11.08. Let's take a three minute screen break and let's get back in three minutes. Thank you.
Okay. <clears throat> Let's keep going. Um, we're now going to go through some examples. Uh, this was all dry, dry, blah, blah, blah. Um, hopefully it gets slightly more interesting going forward. Again, it, it, you know, it just does not replace that in-person interaction and drawing on the whiteboard and so on and so forth. It's all like you got to talk as opposed to draw, uh, which kind of sucks in these webinars, but uh, that's the situation we are in these days. Okay, so the next part, by the way, what's part of the agenda we are in is towards the upper right-hand corner right here. Lessons of, so we are in leverage, okay? Lessons of leverage. Uh, that's where we are. So the question is, is it better to buy rental properties with or without a loan? Hint. So hint. The hint is cash and cash. When you buy on leverage, your cash on cash will increase. Just you take it to the bank, okay? Unless you are doing something really asinine, your cash on cash will increase. So we're going to take some examples now, okay? We're going to run with those same $150,000. We're going to assume you have this in, your, in cash in your bank, and I know there's a lot of you who don't, okay? And I will cover how you could generate cash that will allow you to be in this situation. By the way, on that subject, I have a good friend of mine. Uh, I'm not going to give his full name. His first name is Tom. He's a Vietnamese guy. Came from Vietnam uh, in, uh, we are in 2019. So, so somewhere in the 2005, six, no, not 2005, something earlier than that, early 2000s, okay? He came from Vietnam. Uh, the guy was, literally he started, uh, he's an unbelievable inspirational story. He was, he started, you know, these coupons that you used to get in the Houston Chronicle and back then you had the Houston Post. So you had uh, from Walmart and Target buy a caseload of Coke for so uh, and get whatever, two bucks off, three bucks off. That's what he would do. And then he would take those cans and go and sell it to the 7-Elevens of the world for slightly less. And that's what he kept doing. And his dream was, you know, he used to see these people delivering papers and they were being paid a little bit more. He said, man, if I could only get a pickup. So he started selling newspapers at the corners or something like that he did. And then, I'm sorry, I'm adjusting my uh, footrest. I'm standing up and talking. Uh, and then uh, he, and so he, he made enough cash from this selling Cokes to these convenience stores that he acquired a pickup truck. That was his dream. His dream was to have a pickup truck. That's it. He had no other dreams beyond that. I mean, he couldn't even dream beyond that. Uh, and then he used that pickup truck to start delivering papers, paper out. And then eventually he joined, uh, somehow he joined the US Postal Service and became you know, a letter, uh, a, a mail person. And then he had an epiphany and said, you know what, I need to get into real estate because someone was telling him that real estate, you can make money and blah, 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 blah. And so he started out with that first deal of his, uh, with that money that he had saved working tirelessly and bought one of these beat up houses in a beat up part of town, okay? So this is a guy who barely had a thousand or two thousand or three thousand to buy one of these properties. And then he managed the hell out of it. By the time he managed the hell out of it, he had then added another one and another one. Today, I, I kid you not, his net worth is in excess of $15 million. He has now uh, apartment complexes. He has multiple single families, multiple, you know, duplexes, triplexes, dirt. He has retail. I mean, he's all over the place now. He considers me his business mentor, quite honestly. He, he's way beyond. Uh, 
uh, I kind of advise him on legal and personal issues and stuff like that. Uh, and I've also invested with him. So coming back, if you don't have $150,000, take heart, folks. There are people, if I, if I was, had done this in person, I would have invited him in person to come and talk to you for five minutes and you would have seen firsthand that it's possible. It's possible. Um, so let's assume you have $150,000, excuse me. I left my water. <clears throat> so you could buy one rental property for 150 cash, $150,000, or you could buy four by paying 25% down or 37,500 per, right? We talked about that on the earlier slide. So let's see what happens. Before I go into uh, the graph itself, he, he, here's a little bit of uh, uh, what, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the power of leverage or the power of loans. If you have $10,000 and you bought $10,000 and let's say that value appreciated by $500, your cash on cash is 5% only. So the value increased by $500, it became $10,500, okay? $10,500 and you put in $10,000 is the money that you invested. That's what you do in stocks, by the way. It went up 500 and you go, dang, oh, I'm doing pretty good. I got 5% cash on cash. Or you could use leverage. This is what uh, these REITs do. And 90,000 ends up being borrowed to buy $100,000 worth of property. So out of that pocket, only 10,000. Here's what happens. That same $500, uh, I'm sorry, five, it, gain, it grows in 5%, right? We're saying it, there's a 5% appreciation that took place on the property. So 5% took appreciation on this property too. They bought a $100,000 property. They were able to buy instead of 10,000, they can now buy for 100,000. Same amount of cash came out of their pockets, 10,000. But they use leverage here, loan. So now 5% gain on 100,000 is how much? It's 5,000. How much money did they invest? 10,000. 5,000 divided by 10,000, you have a 50% gain, folks. You can't do it in stocks, but you can do it in real estate because the real estate tax laws greatly favor this kind of stuff. That's what Trump and many of these people are doing. So let's take an actual example. Same, $150,000 ARV of the house. You're buying it completely. It's in good condition. And it pays you $1,500 a month in rent. Okay, let's assume. So with loan and no loan. Let's take, let's take two examples. Let's see what happens. And we have been through these numbers before. So I'm not going to go through it in detail. So you bought for $150,000. 37,500 came out of your pocket, but since it was a no loan in this particular example, this column, 150,000 came out of your pocket. The loan amount is 112,500. Let's say the interest rate is 5%, but here it matters none. Your annual principal and interest PI is 7,247. Here it is none. Are you with me? So now here comes a the income and expense part, this section right here. So 18,000 is what you got from both, less your principal and interest, which is this right here, is 7,247 per year, less property taxes, less insurance. Your net cash that you receive is 5,253. In the case of no loan, you have got more cash because you did not have to pay this right here on this side. There was no loan, but here's what ends up happening. How much cash came out of your pocket? 37,500. How much cash came out of your pocket on this side? 
$150,000. Do the division, 12,500 divided by 150 gives you 8.33. 5,253 divided by this gives you 14%. You're getting more bang for your buck. Has that sunk in? I'm sure it has. But here's another thing that I want to sink in too. The person who made 12,500 is going to end up paying taxes on a big chunk of that 12,500. Carefully understand what I'm saying here, folks. You did not have this deduction, this expense on this side. You had an expense on this side, none on this side. So, I'm sorry, uh, you, you, you had, uh, sorry, cross that out. 12,500 was your net cash that you got. I keep losing my pointer, I apologize. The depreciation on this property of 150,000, you don't depreciate on 150, you depreciate on the structure, not the land portion. So let's assume the land portion is 20,000, okay? The structure is 150, which is the improvement. 130,000, I apologize. So on $130,000, it gets depreciated. You will get roughly about $5,700 in depreciation. Over here, I'm sorry, 4,700, I apologize. That's 4,700. So over here, your net taxable is going to be only $500. So 5253 minus 4,700. Because depreciation is a phantom expense, courtesy of the tax law, courtesy of all that lobbying. On this side, you also get depreciation. You get to use 4,700. Minus 12,000, you're paying on this side taxes folks you're paying on eight thousand dollars almost in taxes on eight thousand dollars worth of income here you will get by paying what zero now there might be some other expenses in managing this property uh, that you will be able to deduct and i get it but that's true for both sides but i'm assuming there's no other expenses let's keep both both apples to apples here uh, in this column, you will get to keep this. Here, you will not get to keep 12,500. You're gonna keep, get to keep 12,500 minus the tax that you will have paid on $8,000 worth of income. And if you are at a marginal tax uh, uh, rate, which might be whatever it is in your case, 30, 35, 25%. So you subtract that from 12,500 is what you end up in your pocket. My friends, the emphasis is on cash, number one. Number two, the emphasis is on cash you get to keep after taxes. Why the heck do you want to pay taxes when you don't have to? That's criminal. That's what all these, these three industries are doing. They've got all these tax loopholes and they're maximizing it. And you, the W-2 income people, keep subsidizing that. It's time you get on to the other side, the dark side or the bright side, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so with that being said, again, let's assume you have $150,000 in cash. You are to buy, you can now buy four properties, okay? Remember, 37,500 you are going to put towards each property and the rest is loan. Or you can buy only one with 100% in cash. People do that. I did it when I started real estate. Dumb, but I did it. Like I said, you learn. Let's see what happens here. So, I'm sorry, let me go back. Uh, you know this example right here, this, these are the numbers that you're going to see on that subsequent graph, okay? 5253 with 
uh, with loan. So it will be if you have to, if you have bought four houses, it'll be five two five three multiplied by four. Here, since you end, ended up putting one hundred and fifty thousand, all of it out of uh, of cash, it'll be twelve thousand five hundred. Okay. So that's what this represents, that if you were to buy with cash, no loan, one property, or with loan, four properties. You see this graph? This graph is kind of going like this. This one is accelerating higher and higher. By the time 10 years rolls around, this is what it is. Look at this box right here. With loan, you have made a total amount of $230,000 with, well, I'm sorry, with loan. And with no loan, you have made a total of 136,872. That's a difference of 93,204. Now, why do you get this acceleration a little bit? The reason is you get to charge extra for rent every year. You know that uh, you're going to charge extra for rent every year, 2%, let's say. And so I'm assuming 2% per year escalation, you're getting that escalation on four properties versus only one property over here. At the end of 10 years, that $150,000 that you invested right here will have resulted in between one scenario, which is no loan, and the other one is with loan, four houses, you will have made $93,000 extra. This is not money I'm pulling out of thin air, folks. This is real. You can do that math every single time. I hope this is coming out clear. Let's take another example. We are now going to add what's called asset appreciation. Remember, assets appreciate, right? The long-term asset appreciation in Houston is roughly, I think about two, you realtors will know more, I think 2.5 or something like that, long-term. Some years less, some years more. But long-term, and if you are in California, you guys are in the stratosphere, okay? I know some of you have logged in from California. Uh, uh, that's a different market. It gets played very differently than here. There you guys are not concerned on cash on cash. You guys are just in, interested in your equity that keeps on appreciating like hundred and two hundred thousand uh, dollars It's mind boggling. So if you have appreciated the, you know, if you assume 2% appreciation in a year, you have appreciated 2% on four properties versus only one. Using a loan, you've been able to, you have a multiplier effect of four. Take a look at the difference in gains. With no loan, you are going to be at 169,000. That is your net cash plus 2% appreciation I'm using. Whereas with four properties and appreciation, you are at 361,000 at the end of year 10. So that person, one person who is doing slow and steady, no loan, no risk, you know, blah, 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 versus someone who decided to take a little bit of risk, this is the difference in 10 year period. Your 150,000 resulted in additional $191,000. Actually, it's even more. Remember in that earlier slide, I talked about taxes. Well, over here, you did not get to use, I mean, you, you are not able to offset that depreciation in your passive income fully. And so you ended up paying more taxes over here. This right here, in this, in this scenario. Here, because you had four properties, you were able to offset depreciation 
you know, I, I, I talked about that on the earlier slide, so I'm not going to butcher up that uh, and say it a little differently, but suffice to say that with this, in this, this, this particular option, you are paying more in taxes too. And you are not going to keep 169,000, you're going to keep a lot less. You'll have given up at least, uh, at least 20 to $30,000. So the difference is actually going to be more like 210 to 215,000. That's courtesy of the tax code. So what are the key takeaways so far? Leverage or loans is a force multiplier, folks. Use it wisely. I'm not going to repeat this, but I'll just say this, $150,000 in cash resulted in a $361,000. Yeah, $361,000. That is on top of the original $150,000 you have in each of those houses, giving you a total on paper worth of at least 511,000 over 10 years. That's appreciation of 240%. This appreciation is steady, is doable. Can you guarantee that in the stock market? Can you guarantee it anywhere else? I mean, it's not guaranteed, so don't, don't, don't take it to the bank, but people are doing this, folks. Honestly, I'm seeing them, they're, they're doing it and they're kicking butt. And this doesn't require rocket science. It's just understanding this, this part. Minimize your cash, maximize your cash, minimize your taxes. As simple as that. Uh, it gets better. Again, courtesy of the tax code that you folks on W2 are funding for those of us in real estate. When you go to sell, when you sell stocks, you gotta pay taxes, capital gains. Here, you can shield or actually defer is the right word for an endless period of time, just about. And when you have not paid taxes, that tax amount can be put to use for investment. So $20,000 in taxes saved each year, for example, just in one year, results in something like if you assume money doubles up, doubles every eight years, I'm saying, be, let's be conservative. Over an eight year period, over a 32 year period, that's going to be what, $160,000. If you had not paid $20,000 in taxes to the IRS. And you do that every single year, and you can see over a 32 or 40 year period, it can be huge. That's my, my, uh, my dear folks, is a secret of all these old money people. You look at all these old money, if you're in Houston, River Oaks and all these places, or if you're in Dallas in that Mockingbird Lane and so on and so forth, Highland Park, it's real estate. That is a huge wealth multiplier because you get to shield a lot of your income from taxes. So a key takeaway, another one, a sweet spot. Where do you want to be where your cash on cash is going to be the best? The thing is, there's no linear relationship between your rent and the value of the property. Just because you get, let's say I'm taking as an example, thousand bucks for a $100,000 property, you do not get 5,000 for a half million dollar property. You just don't. So that, that tax, uh, I mean, sorry, the, the rent that you get on the value of the property, it starts to decrease. You get a little bit more, but it starts to even out. Nobody's going to rent from you a half million dollar house and pay you 5,000 when they can buy it on their own. But at 100,000, there's a whole lot of people who can't afford it. And that's why they're renting. And so that amount, but then they can only pay so much. So just because you have a $300,000 house, you cannot expect those people who are making 10 and 15 and 20 bucks an hour to be paying $3,000 a month in rent. It won't happen. 
So consequently, you got to charge less. And so the sweet spot is roughly in the hundred to two hundred thousand dollars of ARV of the house. Okay, that's where you want to stay. In Texas, you are blessed. There's plenty of properties in that price range. If you are in California, it's different. Like I said, your your whole uh, play is more on capital gains, is not and not on cash and cash. So, so the next point, the three bed, two baths, two car garage is the most popular uh, format for rentals in the country. That's where you'll make the most. At 422, even that is very good. Your square footage ideally should be over here. Oops. No more than 2,000 square feet. And there's a reason for that, which we will talk about in part two. There's only so much I can, uh, you know, uh, keep talking on this, this particular before your eyes start to glaze. Um, but suffice to say, this is the range you want to stay at. That's your sweet spot right there. So when it comes to selling, you want to, when you're ready to exit, uh, there are different ways in which you can sell depending on how you bought it. These are terms that you will run into as you start networking with people called wholetailing. Your wholetailing is nothing else but you're buying a depressed property, a distressed property. And, and a lot of times what ends up happening, I've, I've gone into several houses, they are hoarder houses. Stuff is so packed. I mean, you cannot even walk. You can't even go in the bathroom and you wonder how people are doing this. But there's a lot of people who live like that, folks. Uh, these are hoarder houses. They could be also cat houses where the cat has been peeing all across in that house. And it stinks. So these uh, scare away buyers. But if you are a savvy investor, you can buy that stuff, you can clean it up, and then sell it wholesale. Not to the end investor. You're not repairing anything other than just fixing these things. That's called wholesale. Wholesale, wholesale is when you, uh, we will discuss it in, in the next slide. Then you can also do owner financing. You can you. You bought the property on a loan. You can own or finance it out. And let's say your loan is 5%. You can own or finance it out at 9% interest, 8% interest. The law allows you to go all the way up to, don't quote me on this. You'll have to consult a lawyer. There are lawyers who specialize in this. Uh, people do that. I'm not doing any of that stuff, uh, but people do that, okay? You can rehab and flip that property. That's your another, you, I'm sure most of us have watched HGTV and seeing all that flips. You'll always notice those flips are in expensive neighborhoods. They're either out on the East Coast, Connecticut, or someplace like that, or in California, where the property values are half million, 600, 700. Uh, you can do flips in Houston too. But understand the absolute dollar number is going to be a lot lower than it is in California. In California, you can buy a house for $400,000, put in $100,000 into it, and that house could then be worth $600,000. And your profit could be seventy dollars to $80,000. Here in Houston, you'll be buying a property for $150,000, putting in $30,000, let's say, and then selling it for two twenty, two thirty dollars at most. So the absolute dollar amount is a lot less in Houston, but people are doing it, but you gotta be careful. If you keep it as a rental, then you gotta decide what you're gonna do. There's housing, for example, uh, that is subs subsidized by the HUD, Housing and Urban De De Development Department. Again, it's a tax giveaway by the federal government to landlords, folks. It's money waiting to be earned. You got to keep in mind demographics because if you are in a certain part of town, you will attract a certain kind of demographic and other parts are different demographics. So accordingly, you want to uh, do your remodeling or rehabbing. 
that also influences the maintenance. Uh, your strategy is going to be greatly influenced by the holding period. So if you are going to hold it more, uh, more than one year, you will get capital gains, which is the taxation angle. Uh, there's a time commitment depending on what you want to do. If you're doing uh, this rehab and flip, it will consume a lot of time. And the type of business you have is going to be very different. The type of contractors you need will be different, etc. One of the big tax advantages that you have in selling properties, whether it be office or retail or single family, is this thing called 1031 exchange, which is part of the IRS tax code. Again, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to keep repeating it, but sorry, it's the truth. You can sell and defer those capital gains again and again and again. As long as you never buy another, another property that's like within a certain period, you need to identify those alternatives up front, et cetera. Please consult your CPA. Again, I'm not your tax advisor, but these are being used by savvy investors day in and day out. You need to be aware of it. You're not going to use it right now, but you need to be aware of it that there, there are ways in which you can minimize what you're paying to the IRS even more. Your closing costs. I'm just going to touch on it a little bit. Um, the early examples were very simplistic. I did not include buying and selling costs. Okay. I didn't because it, I didn't want it to clutter up those numbers, but there are closing costs depending on, and, and, and how much it is, is going to depend whether you are a buyer or a seller. I'm not going to read all this. Again, it's going to come to you. Uh, those slides will come to you. For buying anywhere from three to 6%, for selling, it's a little bit higher because you're paying a realtor. The realtors charge quite a bit, and you can negotiate, but uh, they do charge commission. And that'll add up to your fees. And you also have to bear certain expenses when you're selling. When you're buying, it's a big range because it depends whether you're buying with a loan. If you're buying with a loan, then there are some additional expenses that have to be borne. Some of it can be negotiated and some reduced. As you do more, you'll become more savvier and be able to do this more efficiently. When you're doing the first one and the second one, you are nowhere as savvy in the way you will be able to, in, in the way you can maximize the gains that you get from your property. You just won't, unless it is dumb luck. Or, or you have someone who's at your side every step of the way who knows what they're doing. Um, and in the grand scheme of things, don't stress over those closing costs. It's going to be a blip. Remember what I said on that earlier slide, $300,000 in difference, and you're going to be cribbing over $5,000 in closing costs? Seriously? Okay, instead of 300, you make $295,000. Big deal. So, start, yeah, I mean, you want to minimize it. Don't get me wrong, but don't stress over it. So final Takeaways, minimize the cash you put in any deal. Leverage allows for significant increase in profits, net cash over the years. We kind of gone through that, right? The effect of, comp effect of compounding is enormous over the years. That $20,000 in taxes that you saved that I outlined in that earlier example where you just bought it on in cash and you were not able to use uh, or, or shield all of your income in passive losses can add up over a period of time because you could have taken that same money and invested it, but you didn't. It went away, it went to the IRS. Asset increases in value, here's the other thing that I did not discuss. If you're having a rental house, 
you are getting rent, but what's happening to your loan balance if you have a loan balance? That loan balance is decreasing. How is it decreasing? It's because somebody is paying you rental income. This is the beauty. Do you understand that? Your loan balance was decreased by money that was paid by somebody else, not by you. Talk about a win, win, win. You need to be careful of the price point of the ARV to maximize your COC. Like we discussed, 200K or less. Distressed properties, we did not discuss it in detail, present great values and risk. Don't do this at the start, but later on you can, and, and that cash on cash can start going to a really high number. Tax advantages are key. So. Alternatives to owning real, uh, owning re rentals. I'm sorry, we're talking nonstop. Um, so some of the alternatives are flipping houses. We talked about that, right? Um, and the other one is wholesaling. You've seen these signs. They're called bandit signs. I'm sure you've seen it as you drive around. These are the wholesalers. They're putting up these signs and enticing distressed sellers, you know, those hoarder homes that cannot sell it on the open market, no one's going to buy it, or it could be someone has died and it is like the, the kids are fighting over each other and say, you know, the hell with it, just sell it as it is. So these wholesalers are targeting all these people. They're also targeting foreclosures and so on and so forth, all kinds of things. This is distressed selling where the property is not in a great condition. If it was in a great condition, they can list it and a realtor would be able to sell it, right? That's the problem. They are not able to do that. They will not get an end investor. The maximum price will be paid not by an investor, but a person who's going to occupy the house. You know what I'm saying? But the person who wants to occupy the house and think about yourself, you want that house to be like perfect the paint to be perfect and no nicks and scratches and so on and so forth. Well, when you are an investor, the more scratches and nicks and dents, the better. Because that is like kitching, kitching, you lower the price of the house. If it smells of cat urine, there's a friend of mine who said, that's a smell of money. Because nobody's going to touch it. Boy, I've been in a cat, uh, a cat house. And I had to wash my shoes and my clothes, uh, nobody's going to touch it except a savvy investor who knows what they're doing with it. That can be quite lucrative. Wholesalers will buy these kind of properties and turn around and sell it to investors like ourselves. Okay. So the pros and cons. In flipping houses is less capital than buying up-to-date rent houses, but still there's capital involved. But it's a business. There's very little in terms of tax benefit, but there is a one tax benefit that if they classify themselves as, I forget the exact term, that the IRS uses a rental, no, I'm sorry, rental, real estate, something. Uh, if they put in some, 600 or 700 hours a year, then they get to start shielding a portion of their income. If you are a plumber, if you are a florist, do you get to shield any of your income? But the IRS allows you to shield if you are in real estate. Um, In flipping houses, one of the risks, uh, have I mentioned it here? Uh, or you can get into a money pit. By the way, that's me. My first house that I did, it was intended to be a flip because I wanted to learn the whole thing and boy, did I learn. Uh, it, it turned out to be a money pit. I still own it. Uh, the one, one of the things, uh, th this, this is a pretty time in, uh, intensive business flipping houses and actually wholesaling too, both. They're very time intensive. Um, wholesaling, this is, this, this is like you're working 
Saturday and Sunday too. There is no uh, let up. So action items, if you are an investor and you, are, and you want to get off of this W2 income bandwagon where you are writing your tax check every month to the needy multimillionaire, uh, oh boy, I'm, I'm gonna have my dog going crazy. Uh, excuse me, excuse me, please. I apologize. That's what happens when you're doing this from home. Um, yeah, so if you want to get away, uh, get over onto the other side where you're not writing a tax check to the uh, the fat cats and oil and gas and the hedge funds and so on and so forth, uh, please try and see if this is something that would work for you and, and work towards it. One of the things that helps if you're going to do it on a significant basis is to get a realtor's license. It helps a lot. Join local REAs, they're called Real Estate Investment Associations. Every town has one. They're privately owned. Just understand that uh, there's some kind of selling going on over there. Just avoid that other selling that goes on. But the memberships are pretty low, 35, 25 bucks a year. Uh, just be careful of the angles, okay? And there will be plenty. But here you will have all kinds of speakers talking about every kind of things and you will expand your knowledge tremendously. Learn from presentations, and then there's lots of get-togethers, by the way. Uh, the people that I, that I told you, hard money lending, the people who do long-term lending, all of them have get-togethers every month, all of them. Matter of fact, there's a joke amongst these uh, people who are doing this professionally that you can get by without having dinner at home every single day of the week, except for Friday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday because they serve odors and stuff like that and, and wine too. Uh, and someone is talking and someone's got an angle, that's okay, you're there to learn. So network, network, network. Um, you'll have to develop eventually your investor-friendly tradesmen. The people that you call for plumbing, they're not the ones you want to call folks. They're high-priced people. The people who you call normally to do your roofing, that's not who you want. Those are high priced people. These people specialize in pricing for investors because they know they're getting volume. Uh, you need to do at least four to six months of research in my opinion. Don't be hasty and you gotta learn. When you buy, buy one property that needs very little rehab. Don't buy something like a hoarder home or a cat house. That'll sink you. Um, and it's only after you have uh, done the three houses, in my opinion, that you'll really start to understand this business. On the first and second one, you'll have barely gotten it into it. You'll be learning, but not until you start doing a remodel of 30 to 35,000 will you really understand. Careful when exit selling, have a mentor, folks. Uh, whether that's me or anybody else, I'm in score, I don't charge anything. Nobody in SCORE is allowed to charge. We're free. You can, uh, we, have, we have mentors for legal. We have mentors for accounting. Uh, we will not do your taxes. We won't do your legal paperwork, but we can give you advice. Um, and you can choose as many mentors as you want. And, and SCORE is in just about every town across the US, okay? And also we are available by email and phone call. If you go to score.org, uh, you'll be able to see a bunch of mentors. But, but I'll tell you one thing, there's not that many mentors in SCORE who will know this business the way I explained. Um, they, most of them come from corporate or they might have done a little bit of investing, uh, but every bit is useful. 
go for it. So let's talk about this COVID and what's happening right now and, and how it has impacted the overall screen, uh, the scene. So right now it's a buyer's market. Uh, you remember I talked about flippers who take up a property and they, they do something and then they flip it for a higher price. Well, the end buyers are right now staying away. Why? Nobody knows about the, they're insecure about their jobs. So those buyers have disappeared. Now these people have bought these properties and they're paying hard money loans, high interest rates. And when they do that, they're sweating bullets, folks. And so there's some level of distress selling that I'm seeing in the market now. Uh, wholesalers are finding demand from retail, uh, rental investors, people like me, is down. So this is the time you can find good deals and it's going to pick up. Airbnb investors, remember we talked about Airbnb on I think that second or third slide, there's a bunch of people who took properties and put it out on rent on Airbnb. Great business. Trouble is when travel crashes, what happens to your Airbnb? You know, that's a problem situation. Uh, lenders have turned more conservative. Just like during 2008, 2009, they are now demanding more money out of your pocket to buy a house than 25% like they did before. Renters are struggling, uh, especially in the low income area. Uh, that's not across the board, but uh, I would say as of right now, anywhere between 10 to 20% are having challenges making rent. But there's quite a few of us who are still making rent. So on the horizon, what's coming up? It depends on what's your view of COVID. You feel that vaccines and treatments are going to come along, then this is a great time to buy. If you think it's going to not be the case, then this might stay around for a lot longer. Uh, but see, that's the crux of the issue, right? Hindsight is always 2020, and people will say, you know, and this guy, you know, he had stomach of steel and went and bought 20 properties when nobody else was buying, and I's made a killing. Well. Are you that person with guts of steel? Um, I, I believe there are nuances in here. Uh, so you don't want to make broad brush strokes in your judgment, okay? You don't want to do that. Um, there are nuances in this market that you can still capitalize on. Um, in talking to people and including just from my gut feel over the years, there's a distinct chance of increased bankruptcies to come over the next 12 to 18 months, unfortunately. That happened during 2008, 2009 recession. We had a lot of bankruptcies come up in 2011, 12. There's a time lag because, you know, these people are trying to struggle uh, to make those payments. The bank has to issue all kinds of notices and then it takes several months to evict people. Uh, so that process takes a while and then Right now, there's a bunch of investors who are just licking their chops, waiting on these foreclosures. I'm not into that, but you might be. You might want to. Uh, I, I prefer not to focus on that part of the market, but there's going to be opportunities in that market if that's where you want to be. Investors with dry powder, i.e. you have cash. This is your ability to close deals that others can. Therefore, you can get good, good properties. And finally, you know, take the long picture, okay? This is going to come and go. Remember I told you about uh, rent or real estate in general, residential over the decades has been going like this. When it comes to rental, we have a, uh, again, it's not whether you're a Democrat, Republican, or whatever. 
ask yourself those people who are making eight bucks an hour, 10 bucks an hour, or 50, even 15 bucks an hour, can they even afford to buy a house of their own? Or even if you're making 17 bucks an hour, you know, it's tough. All you're doing is making around 40,000 a year. That's it. Now you and your half spouse are making that kind of money, then you can buy a house. But the rest, they're going to be renting. This is going to become, already is, and it's going to become more so a nation of renters. So the landlords who are renting with these favored uh, codes in the tax code that allow you to defer taxes or escape from paying taxes, folks, in my opinion, rental real estate is going to be here for a long time. It's going to be profitable. It's going to increase. The demand is going to be increasing. So final wrap up. This is in part two, two parts. This was the first part today. You know, I had to go through a lot of basics. In part two, we are going to talk about how to acquire more properties with less cash, i.e. how do you use hard money. The acquisition process uh, is different. You don't go to your normal realtor. That's not where it happens, okay, it's different. And consequently, there are some gotchas. What does the loan process look like? What does the remodeling process look like? Getting a renter, that's key, right? That's the whole point of it all. And then secrets to keeping your cost down and income high, maintenance, so on and so forth. Basically the crux of how to do this. Um, that's going to be on May 2. That's two Saturdays from now. Uh, you'll need to sign up when that email comes out. Please remember to do that. And uh, yeah, so I hope you come for that second part. That's where we are going to discuss all the details of converting this into cash. And good luck. So I'll take a few questions. Um, if you guys have typed in your question, let me see. Some of you have requested to speak on video conference. It won't be possible. Uh, there's a glitch in the way this is being done and I can't. So the first question I'm answering, uh, does SBA provide funding for a business startup to purchase real property? The answer is yes. You said real property so far, warehouses, uh, office buildings, uh, so on and so forth, they do. Uh, but there are some caveats, okay? You have to go there and occupy 51% of the property for the section, I think they're called 70 or 504. Uh, but I'm not an expert in finance. Someone else in SCORE will be able to answer your question more effectively, okay? Next one, do you feel it is worth to obtain a real estate license? Absolutely. And find a sponsor that will charge significantly less than the typical, well, uh, you will have to hang your license, they call it, under a broker. And the broker, and you'll become a broker after five years of being a realtor. It's just how that law works. Uh, but I would, you know, look, again, don't stress over pennies, okay? Find the cheapest broker out there and get going. Uh, because the money that you can make from real estate is far, far more than those few little uh, thousand dollars or whatever it is that you will have to pay to a realtor. Uh, what about vacancy and repair? Uh, we're going to talk more about in, that in the second part, uh, Ron. Uh, you know, I had to start with the basics today. So yeah, there is vacancy and there is repair. I wanted to keep the examples very simple. Uh, there are ways in which you can avoid vacancy, which is the tips that I'm going to pass on in the next section. Uh, that's the part two. And repair, yes. Uh, that's why for today's uh, session, I assume no repairs. I didn't want to complicate things. Uh, 
uh, someone else asked uh, uh, for rental property, same question, was repair cost once rental leaves accounted for? The answer is no. Uh, again, wanted to keep the, uh, the numbers straightforward. If I tried to put all that in, it would have complicated things. We have on this webinar newbies who have not done any uh, rental real estate at all. Uh, but that's those are good points. Yeah, there are costs involved and there are ways to minimize it. Uh, what is your take on cash call? I unfortunately hate interest, so I've always paid more. But more and more people are telling me to only pay principal, PI, principal and interest. What is your take on a cash? Uh, I unfortunately hate interest so you're talking about buying it totally on cash so i i went through the the examples uh, look you know if you you absolutely hate loans then uh you know that's your uh personal uh economic and psychological makeup perfectly understandable i just outlined to you the differences and the ones who are able to squeeze a lot of money out of real estate as to what they're doing um, but you know different strokes for different people uh, what happens when tenant quits paying during a downturn and gets special government protections okay uh, so that's happening right now uh, so i have properties and i can tell you that it all comes down to what kind of a tenant did you select okay uh, that's why we're going to cover that in the second part. Um, but if the tenant doesn't pay today, you cannot evict that person. But in the state of Texas, which is very friendly to landlords, is one of the most friendliest states. Uh, if you are in, forget uh, this virus thing right now, but in the state of Texas, you can have that person evicted within two months max, okay? Uh, there might be some special situations, but it's actually even less than two months. If you move fast, uh, Texas is just not friendly to low-income people. Just the way it is. It is employer, landlord friendly state. As opposed to some place like Connecticut, for example, your eviction process could take nine to 12 months. And during that time, you're paying to your loan company and all your taxes and all that stuff. So it's, it gets pretty rough. And that's why those states also have high housing costs. So Texas is at the other end of the spectrum. Um, so when they, today, when they quit paying rent, you can still file an eviction notice, okay? What the state of Texas has said, the Texas Supreme Court has said, they will not entertain any evictions until, well, it's now come, April 15. It'll be interesting to see what happens after that. After that, they'll proceed with those people, or those landlords who had already filed eviction two weeks back. They'll go in that first come, first served basis. And you could see people being evicted. Um, the crux of the matter is the government just can't say, you know, you got to keep these renters for free. Well, we landlords also have cost. We have cost to pay the mortgage. We have property taxes. You know, Harris County says, oh, you shouldn't throw people out. Well, excuse me, are you willing to now waive those property taxes as well? Is the insurance company going to waive the premiums that you pay? Well, you got your cost. That's not going away. So, uh, and I understand that there's a bunch of folks who can't and you don't want to throw them out on the street. So somewhere the federal government has to come in and step in and say, how do we make this thing work? But to answer your question, I think you're referring to what's going on right now, get special government protection. The only protection you have in the state of Texas is that then the courts are not taking evictions up until April 15. After that, it's supposed to start. People will start getting evicted, okay? Unless they extend that by a little bit more, but I don't think they'll 
extend that indefinitely. Won't happen. Something, next question, something I've been battling. What year do you figure out the depreciation? The year you purchase, my friend, you should not consult a CPA. Your depreciation starts from the year you buy. Uh, my tax papers, land structure values change every year. It don't matter. It's what you have bought it for and what capital improvements you made. All that collectively will add up to the capital uh, capital cost of your property, and that's what you end up depreciation. Uh, that's what you'll depreciate. Again, I'm not a CPA. A CPA would be able to answer it very accurately. I've been told by several realtors that my law and industrial can only owe five FHA or conventional loans at a time. Okay, that's a good question. It's not FHA. These are conventional loans that are backed by Fannie and Freddie. Uh, depending on which bankers you go to and you want to go to investor-friendly bankers, you go to JP Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo, you're going to get a different answer, folks. Those banks are not investor-friendly. Uh, there's an entirely different group of lenders out there. And that's why you need to get in and start networking and, and know that there's the entire group of people from plumbers to electricians to roofers to lenders that are focused only on investors and they're investor friendly. The short answer is on your individual, you can go up to nine uh, long term. Freddie, Fannie may back loans. If you and your wife, you could do 10 on your name and nine on the other person, total of 19. That's what I've been told by a lender. Uh, other lenders, I mean, I've gone to my daughter's credit union and they said maximum of five. So you just find a lender who will do more. And it, 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 it is, uh, it's, it's more than five. Can we get these slides? Yes, absolutely. What banks do you recommend to get loans for rental properties? Uh, not, yeah, i.e. Bank of America, nope, nope, not Chase. Uh, none of those folks. Yeah, yeah, see, this is why you are coming to this webinar. That's not the place you go. They'll not give you. They will say the value of this house that you're buying is only worth 100,000 when the ARV is 150, we're gonna give you a loan on 100,000. And sometimes they may not even give you a loan. If that loan, uh, if that house is a hoarder house or a cat house and it's stinking, they'll say, uh -uh, this is uninhabitable. That's the word they use. It has to be habitable. Habitable means there has to be water, there has to be running water, electricity, all that good stuff. But many of these distressed properties, they are lying vacant and the utilities have been cut off. So normal lenders would lend and you don't even want to go to them. Remember I told you how you can buy houses for a lot less than that 37,500? That's what we're gonna discuss in part two. When is too much leverage too risky? Well, okay, that's a good question. Uh, you gotta have cash reserves to handle any, uh, the earlier question, what if the renter were to stop paying? You gotta have cash reserves to be able to handle payments of at least six to nine months, okay? So you have to understand recessions over history have only lasted about nine months on an average, and then things pick up. So if you can handle, and, and it's not like renters disappear these people still have to rent. So you can reduce your rent, you're gonna get money. You may not be able to get money to cover your full expenses, but at least you'll get some. And I'll pay for your taxes and stuff like that. Um, so now, if the property gets hit by a tornado, that's different. For that, you buy what's called loss of rents. It's a different type of insurance. Again, we're gonna discuss that in part two. I keep saying part two, I'm not trying to uh, uh, get y'all to come to part two, but there's only so much I could discuss today. Please clarify, adding updates such as countertops and new roof, does that add value to your property as you stated? 
the comparative market analysis of other houses, the rule of thumb standard. Yes, Monique, that is the rule of uh, what other properties that sold at a certain price point, what did those houses have? If they had granite countertop, then, and if they had uh, beautiful bathrooms, then you need to get your house to come up to that level to get that valuation, okay? But we're not buying houses where you live. And just because you like granite doesn't mean you got to put in granite for your renters. Most of my renters will not care if there's granite or not. They're more interested in what's the rent. So there's something known as doing too much in a property and that's not what you want to do. Remember, minimize your expenses, minimize your cash. Thank you, thank you very much. When is part two being held? I hope I answered that two Saturdays from now, that's May the second. What are your thoughts on having a different LLC and bank account for each property? Please don't do that. It's an overkill, like you say, yep, it is an overkill. You will accomplish nothing. Uh, you can own properties in your own name and have umbrella liability insurance and take care of any liability issues because the moment you put it into an LLC, your ability to get those, that long-term funding, the ones that are backed by Fannie and Freddie, disappear. Okay, another question on the next webinar. Please let me know the time on the May 2nd webinar. It'll be about the same time, maybe half an hour later, 10.30 or so. Uh, but, but you'll get an email. How do you trade RE back notes, real estate back notes? Ah, well, you'll start getting letters, my friend. Uh, when you have a house with, and you're making those payments on time, uh, this stuff is publicly available now, uh, data, and you'll start getting uh, uh, letters asking you to, whether you're willing to sell, uh, you know, your, your note. Like for example, you have done owner financing and you have financed a note to another uh, a buyer, let's say you did owner financing. This is kind of going out of, out of scope, but people do that. Uh, you'll start getting from all kinds of people. There's there's businesses that just specialize in that. Uh, and as far as trading, there are uh, brokers, and it's a matter of just building up your network of buyers and sellers. Um, Will there be a recording webinar of this we can review? The answer is yes, yeah, it is being recorded, but we haven't figured out yet on how to share it. Uh, the only way we know is to download it, which is extremely huge file. Uh, so just bear with us. So we will try and get the recording, the web link out uh, once we can. We are a nonprofit, so we don't really have pros on our staff. Everybody's doing it for like, I'm doing this, I don't get compensated even one buck. Uh, and all my mentoring is all free, including that of every single score mentor. Uh, that being said, because we are a nonprofit, we are also poor. So, so we don't have the greatest of infrastructures. Uh, next question, when you make the 14% year on year gains from the leverage property buying, isn't that still a 10 plus year period to break even from cash out of pocket? Uh, are we just trying to break even with the rent money until the loan is paid off? No, my friend. Uh, when did the positive cash flow come in to live off and quit your job? Well, that's a good question because the whole point of passive income is to generate enough income to quit your job. Uh, the question uh, you've asked it a little incorrectly. You're not trying to pay down that loan uh, to be able to uh, quit your job. You're just trying to get enough cash, cash. So that in our example, we had, what is it? 12,000 or something. So you, you have 10 of those, you got $120,000. That $120,000, my friend is going to be almost tax-free. That's the equivalent of making almost 160 to $180,000 on a W-2 income because you'll be paying taxes and all that stuff. And by the time they deduct everything in your hand, 
as you all know, you end up with a lot less. So I would look at it a little differently. In your examples, why are you using 25% down instead of 20%, which is more typical? Uh, look, I'm using 25% just as an example. You want to use 20%, go for it. The returns will be higher. The flip side is you're taking also more risk uh, because you will have a higher note to pay. It's an individual choice and it depends on which, uh, uh, which, which renter, uh, I'm sorry, which bank will give you what kind of terms, okay? You mentioned insurance companies that provide insurance, yes, uh, there are insurance companies that specialize in insurance for landlords because what landlord needs is very different. Uh, you need the ability to cover your butt should while workers are working in your property, something happen. Uh, it's called a builder's risk policy. Uh, there is uh, another part, empty vacant house. Vacant house uh, has its different... Um, uh, th these are all uh, different things that uh, these insurance companies that specialize in landlords, with landlords, will offer. And you need to attend these uh, get-togethers. Like I said, just get into involved with one or two. And pretty soon you will get sucked into a whole bunch. So much so that I have trouble trying to unsubscribe to a new email that I get to go into another one. Um, uh, yeah, that is that, well, homeowner insurance is different. This is not homeowner insurance, friend. That's the next question. Follow up. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is not homeowners insurance. This is it's called a different. Right off the top of my head, it escapes me. Uh, but it's not for homeowner. You are not living there. That's different. Explain about holding real estate like LLC, real estate like LLCs, corporations, about corporate veil piercing. Uh, that is way off the subject, my friend. Uh, just text me separately, email me. Uh, my focus is on how to get you guys uh, a portfolio of rental, rental houses, uh, LLCs, corporations, I'm not sure what you're trying to achieve. So let's discuss that offline. On 1030 when exchange, can we exchange two properties for one? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I'm not a tax, uh, I mean, I've just done one to one. I don't know the answer. You have to call up the 1031 exchange who is administering it and they'll tell you. Uh, the problem you'll get into is timing because 1031 exchanges have a fixed time in which you have to execute that transaction. And so it becomes a balancing act in trying to get your previous property sold within a certain period and the new one bought in that same period. Uh, can you be my mentor? Yes, that's what we are here for. Uh, absolutely, I'll do it to the best of my ability. That was a question, by the way. Can you be my mentor? Uh, yeah. Um, thanks, it was very informative. Thank you very much. If, can we, okay. Can we exchange, again, uh, more than one properties for only one property? Yeah, that's going the other way. Uh, I don't know the answer to that, uh, Rita. Uh, but if you if you pull up a 1031 exchanges, there's a bunch of them on the on, on internet. Uh, any of them will be able to answer your question. Will we look at some real estate examples of properties and how to evaluate numbers in the second part? To a certain extent, okay? Because remember, the stuff that I'm teaching today and next time usually is taught in an all day class over two days. And we are shrunk it down to two hours each, including QA, I might add. Uh, 
it's hard to talk about all these things. So if you want to talk, take it offline, we can talk about it, okay? Uh, but I have to do it in a way that is like the least common denominator for everyone. Uh, the example, in, next question implies that you can expense the principal portion of the loan for tax purposes. Uh, see, I kept it simple. Your answer is, uh, your question is right. You cannot expense the principal portion. You just can't. It's only the interest portion. Uh, but in the beginning, most of your payment that you're paying to the bank, the principal is going to be a minor, small amount. Expense is going to be the much bigger amount. So I didn't want to, uh, you know, go into all those nitty gritties and muddle up that example. But you, you cannot expense uh, the principal part, just the, uh, the interest part. I, if I'm owner financing a house, how can I use that property when talking with lenders? Well, I don't know if you are living in a house that you are paying or are you owner financing a house to another owner and getting payments from them. So I'm not sure which way you're doing it. And the question is, how can I use that property when talking with lenders. Uh, well, when you're doing owner financing, the one who has done the financing is the lender. So if you are having a house, let's say worth $100,000, and you go ahead and owner finance it to another party, then you are the lender. I don't know if I've made sense to you, but uh, I'm not sure where, what exactly you are getting at. Uh, but you can email me separately. When you build on a vacation lot, do you take out a building loan and then it converts to a mortgage once the building process is complete? I have a vacant 5,000 square foot lot that I'm looking to build on and develop into a rental property, perhaps a multi family that I would live in a unit as well. Uh, you might qualify, yeah. Uh, there's several banks who will do that. This is pretty standard stuff whether it'll qualify for SBA. The SBA has a restriction in that you have to be in 51% part of the property. And the remaining 49% can be rented out. But uh, so if you are doing multifamily, if you do like a fourplex, you could live in one of them, one of them and rent out the other three. But the thing is, normal banks will do that for you. And the fourplex, you can then move it into a long-term mortgage. Um, so it's all doable, yes. Thanks, great insight. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 beautiful presentation, thank you. How do we obtain your presentation? We will be emailing it to you. Do you mind expanding on how to get insurance coverage for investment properties? Uh, there's a bunch of brokers in town. Uh, it's an anonymous attendee. Um, I, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, there's a whole bunch. Uh, so I, I'm not sure what you want me to expand on uh, for insurance coverage. If you attend these uh, RIAs, R-E-I-A, I mean, your head will go around trying to run, figure out who to get it from. There's so many of them. Um, question, where it is a good idea to start studying about property management? Do I need a license to manage properties? Oh, very simple. Good idea to start studying about property management. Do your own property. There's only one way, you work for a property management company or you have a, your own rental house and you learn a lot by man, just managing that particular property. Today, if I wanted to start a property managed business, I can't because I know a lot of the tricks of the trade. Uh, I know where I can get 
uh, this trades, you know, uh, roofer and electrician and so on and so forth from. And you don't need a license for that. So you do it through your own uh, experience or you have to work in a property management company. How can I mentor with you? Is it possible in quarantine? Well, that's the thing. Uh, with, uh, with this situation right now, this COVID situation, I won't be meeting anyone one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, all of us core mentors, we're doing it through Zoom or email or phone, okay? You mentioned condos make poor investments. Why is that? Just because historical reasons. Uh, it might make good, uh, uh, where do condos make good investment? New York City, San Francisco, places like that, where there is a crunch and it's virtually impossible to have a single family house. Uh, you can't have a single family house in Manhattan unless you're filthy, filthy rich. Uh, so that, that's where it would make sense. In a place like Houston, here's the thing to, uh, if you are given a choice between a condo and a house with a backyard, what do you think families prefer? They prefer houses. So if someone, if you're catering to rental, uh, the rental, uh, you know, the people who are making 10 bucks an hour and 15 bucks an hour or 20 bucks an hour, they have a family, they have kids. The kids can't play in a condo. So consequently, there's less demand for condos for rentals, unless they're single people. Uh, and so your, your market shrinks. The other thing with condos is you get into a problem with maintenance down the road, okay? So this is not just me saying it, just historically, if you look at the performance of condo pricing, it has not fared anywhere as well as with rental single family houses. Where to buy insurance for a rental house? Oh, uh, not from my agent, but who were. Uh, again, that question I answered, uh, just go to these uh, RIA meetings, um, Bonnie, there's a bunch of them. Um, if you want, you can email me and I'll give you a couple. How about that? They just don't advertise openly. They're only, uh, you know, they, they attend these events. They sponsor them too, by the way, uh, because they want you to get insurance through them. What is the advantage of rental insurance? Uh, well, that's uh, that question has not been worded correctly. You're buying insurance on the property and what you're buying for is if it were to burn down and stuff like that. If your renter were to go out there and damage the property, uh, that's different and there tends to be a deductible. Uh, but otherwise you need to have an insurance, right? For your house. What if something happens, an earthquake or a fire or whatever and the whole thing burns down? Uh, you're gonna be in trouble, my friend. So you got to have insurance. Uh, you've said rental insurance. There's also something called renter's insurance, which is different. That is for the renter who stays in that property. So if you're living in an apartment complex, for example, or even in single families, the landlords will force you to get renter's insurance, which covers your belonging. And there'll be a liability part that uh, the landlords will say you need to uh, you know, add the landlord as the additional insured because your bull, uh, your, your pit bull, if he were to go and bite some other, your neighbor, the neighbor tries to sue the owner of the property because they want to go with some, to someone who's got the money. So you force your renters to get renters insurance for that reason. Is it possible to revert an LLC for real estate to access credit as individuals like mentioned? Yes, you can. What you do is if that, pro I'm assuming the property is held by the LLC, uh, you would just deed it. So 
whenever you are ready to go for long term in uh, uh, long term uh, loan they'll take care of all that the tax code limits the amount of deduction on a property expense yearly and the balance can be carried forward how long can you carry that loss i know my friend you are saying it incorrectly the cat tax code does not limit the amount of deductions you can deduct all your expenses but i think your point is that if there are losses to what extent you can carry the forward uh, i mean how much losses you can apply in uh, i'm going out on a limb here i'm not a cpa uh, but you can apply all your losses to all your uh, uh, passive income as long as those are business losses capital losses are different okay capital losses apply to capital gains and passive income applies to passive losses uh, and then you can carry it forward if 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 it, you know your income was just not adequate you go into the next year and next year you can apply all of it depending on your situation next question do you recommend using equity from an existing home to purchase re rental homes absolutely that's what they do all the time that's called a, a refi you may have heard of that uh, so you do a cash out refi that way you get cash and you go out and put it into the next house that is 101 of real estate investing you start with one house and you remember i told you about my friend tom uh, who went to a net worth of 15 million that's what he did he improved that property and then he got another loan because that property had now gained in value substantially he cashed out that portion and applied that in more properties and that's how that whole thing works so the short answer to that question is a yes to list a rental house myself or have a realtor to list out on har which way is better or you have to well, see now that's where i'll talk about some tricks in the next part the question is do i rent a uh, rental house do i use a realtor to list or do it do i do it by myself i try to do it by myself okay but but it all depends on where your property is is it getting enough uh, visibility and so on and so forth which are some of the secrets i'll share in that second part uh, if your property is not easily visible then you need to list it list it if you are in on mls because that gives you the widest audience but then you're paying someone commission uh, which may be fine but you know that's doable but it all depends on your particular property there's no one answer how do we become your mentee thank you for your time uh well when you are ready just email me and then we can connect i've given you my e email address and i'll do the best i can uh, i remember as a score mentor unpaid nonprofit there's only so much mentoring i can do in the sense of i can't come with you on the property site or some stuff like that and so i'll be giving you advice whatever i can be a phone is your opinion how much is a good and bad interest rate of a loan to buy now in your opinion how much is a good and bad interest rate for long-term financing right now it's currently at about four and a half percent just fyi um, for rental properties so if you're paying five and a half or six that's not good from what SBA office do you mentor from? I would like to sign up and receive mentorship. Uh, well, Houston SCORE is headquartered in off of Southwest Freeway, the federal building. Uh, I forget the address right now. And SBA has a floor to itself and we share that floor. But if you're talking about mentoring from me personally i don't even go to that office 
most of us mentors today, not most all, are doing it by phone or email, okay? Nobody's meeting anyone because of the virus situation. So feel free to email me. Uh, I need to learn cash out refi, please teach me. I tell you what, Courtney, any, you attend any, any of these, uh, these get togethers, this stuff gets brought up, they discuss it. The lenders love to tell you about it as to how you can do a cash out refi. Uh, if you want to email me separately or call me, I mean, I'll tell you very quickly. See, a lot of these things that we are covering is, is the cobwebs that we tend to have that prevents us from taking the next step. I do, how do I do this? How do I do that? And so hopefully with these two webinars, enough of those things will be cleared up where at least you'll know, or at least you'll be more informed to take the next step. Uh, how do you get with in, in investors to help with investing and getting started? Uh, this is by Anonymous. How do you get with an investor? Well, uh, I'm not sure from what angle you're asking. Are you asking from an investor to take an equity participation? Very difficult unless you know that investor. If you're talking about getting a loan from an investor, there are what's called private money investors. And they give, give you loans based on your asset that you're acquiring. Uh, I'm not sure if there was another angle to that question. Can you buy properties under a business name or does it have to be personal? What kind of credit is required to get started? Uh, if you're going in for, see, it depends on what you're buying. Okay, that's a loaded question. Buy properties. Uh, let's keep it simple. If it's a single family house, then uh, you you don't need to buy it under a business name because if you do, you will not be able to avail yourself off of the long, for, off the long-term financing. And at that point in time, you'll need to deed it to your individual name to get the Fannie Freddie back loans. Uh, what kind of credit is required? Uh, funny, uh, when you go into rental prop properties, you need, uh, it used to be more than six, 40, something like that. I think they have tight, I, I don't know. Uh, when, when it comes to these uh, uh, investor loans, they're different. The criteria tends to be different, okay? Um, they are wanting two years of tax returns. They are wanting enough cash in the bank uh, and stuff like that uh, to be able to make that loan. Uh, the criteria is, not as stringent as you would face if you are going in for a regular home mortgage for your own self. But at the same time, there's some uh, credit score criteria. I would like to say 700, but I'm not sure if that's true because it tends to change with this virus thing, things have changed. Anyway, that's all the questions. Thank you very much, folks. Uh, and we'll share with you the presentation. Bye-bye.